uh, as you know, was invented during World War II. It's something that came out of World War II, uh, out of the radar systems and the jamming and counter jamming uh, with, against the Nazis. All of that electronic world came out of World War II, and so it was already up and running, and along comes the average ordinary human being, the Elvis Presley or the Marilyn Monroe. Uh, they don't know uh, what kinds of effects, uh, the kinds of psychological feedback effects, that this electronic technology is going to induce on them, so they just sort of naively jump into this. And then the tragedies of their lives are the results of the process. So we have these concrete case studies then of what happens when the human being descends into this electric plasma pool, replicates his image to light speed or her image, and then suffers the, the consequences of a destabilized psyche as a result. But then, so I brought that book all the way down to the present. Uh, and the last chapter of the book leaves off with talking about how the new media such as Facebook and uh, Twitter and all the, the, and the, like the media that we're using now, uh, how the celebrity was kind of the test case of descending into that type of media and now it's being democratized to the rest of us because as Andy Warhol figured out, all you need to do is step in front of a camera to achieve some kind of, and accelerate yourself to light speed to, to achieve some kind of fame even if it's just fame amongst a small circle of individuals. Fame can be had by anyone under electronic conditions. So uh, that's where that book left off, and I started to wonder it then about, uh, we've had a media explosion in the past 15 years, ever since 1995 when the internet was turned over to the public sector by the NSA, who had it at that, up to that point. And then uh, it just became the main en engine driving uh, commerce in our society, and then all these gadgets that had pre-existed it, such as the video cassette recorder and the video camera, started changing and modifying so that they could plug into the internet and interface with it. And so the landscape configured by the internet got larger and larger and larger. It destabilized our society. I'm convinced it's linked to the current economic crisis. The psyche takes a while to adapt to the new changes that are uh, exerted upon it by new technologies that come along. They always exert pressure on us. Even when we're not aware of that, uh, they always do. It's and so I wondered then, uh, you know, McLuhan's been dead for uh, since the, what, 81, 82. And I wondered what he would have thought about all these new little gadgets. And so I went out looking for such a book. And as you know, all these books are written by academics now who have only studied that area. So if you try to sit down and read a, a new media book by an academic, and there are a lot of them, uh, what you get is just references to the media itself. You don't get references to Egyptian Old Kingdom architecture. You don't get references you know, to, to, to the totality of cultural history that this stuff is, is linked to. In, in one way or another, it's conversing with the totality of civilization. That which, which I find value in, which, which you find value in. Uh, one yeah. of the things I think I've heard, apply to it was yeah, I, I've heard you mention something before that um, you're, you were interested in looking at things that are just so normal and take it for granted. Um, and it reminds me of something I think McLuhan said, and I, I get this from Terence McKenna, and I, so I could be wrong, uh, but he said something like, whoever discovered water, it certainly wasn't a fish. Yeah, it wasn't a fish. <laughs> so so the, uh, uh, the, the idea is that the... The media that we, we kind of swim in have become so um, comfortable, or if not comfortable, they've become invisible in a sense. Yeah, this is what McLuhan himself called the rearview mirror effect, which right. is to say that, um, you don't notice the environment you're in until you're out of it. And then the same thing with a culture. Uh, once the culture is out of an environment, suddenly it becomes fascinating and we get the Western, for example. During the days when we were in the West, there was nothing fascinating about it because we were in it. Right. Once we're out of it, the West is dead and gone by the 1920s, and then with silent film, it starts becoming, through the rearview mirror effect, the, the fascinating thing. So we want to know what exactly happened back there. Right. So that's the, the um, cultural phenomenon. So yeah. I think that's a pretty good background. So I kind of want to go a little bit backwards, but also really maybe more holistically, and kind of begin uh, with, the, with the end and the beginning at the same time, where you're talking about... Uh, in chapter 12, you're talking about a concept that you had mentioned in Celluloid Heroes uh, of the World Cave. And I think there you were talking about it as um, the Paleolithic images that are sort of flickered. And um, uh, specifically, although as well, linking it to something called the Ove Pod, uh, which I had heard of and I looked up, and it looks like this totally bizarre. 
it looks like some returning to the mechanical womb in a sense. And it, re yeah. it occurred to me that oh, it goes into one of these self-contained entertainment sarcophagi is in fact attempting to entomb themselves into the technology to dematerialize themselves in this almost Kurtzvalian, uh, and that I wanted to ask you about Kurtzfeld too when you think about him uh, in this sense, which is um, really maybe the, the, the most powerful, I think, image that um, uh, maybe we could muster, or one of them anyways, as, as to kind of reveal what's happening with that. Yeah, the Ovipod is, is kind of amusing. It's, it's very interesting. It's a gadget that you sit in, and, and it looks suspiciously to me like somebody watched The Empire Strikes Back and saw Darth Vader in his black chamber that comes down like that, because it, it, it's very evocative of that. And uh, so you sit in this, in this pod, and you get into it. The door closes, and you're completely isolated from the outside, and you're just thrust in front of a video monitor, and you have this sort of ultra-remote control where you can flip modes. You can do video games or the Internet or watch movies, whatever you want. But it, I guess the point of it is that it isolates you uh, from distractions so that you can fully immerse yourself into this electro-landscape. And to me, it seems like a complete failure of the human position in the world. It, to, to have to retreat to that degree, to me, seems utterly frightening. But what I did in the book was I looked back at these, co these cavern cosmologies, and right. uh, civilization, as we all know, originated in the Paleolithic caves, where they didn't actually live in the caves, they just went into them for initiation processes. But I believe that they saw the cosmos as a giant cave, and that the images of the animals on the ceiling are actually constellations. And there's a German uh, scholar named Michael Raffenbluth who has this theory that uh, we find the oldest constellation of the Taurus bull, for example, in Lascaux, and you can see the six dots of the Pleiades uh, on the cave wall directly above it. So these were actually the constellations of the night sky, and it's the world cavern and the dome uh, that encloses us. That cosmology, though, has been basic to civilization all the way down the line until Copernicus changed it. In the uh, 16th century, long about 1543, he was the first one. He wanted to retrieve the idea of the perfect circular motions of the planets from Plato, because he was reading Plato, the printing press had come along, and we were getting all these new translations of the ancients and Plato. Plato was the big figure during the Renaissance, and he, Plato says that this, the soul is in the form of a circle and the planets move in perfect circles, but the cosmology at that time, if you look up the planets and you study them, they don't move in perfect circles, they do weird things. And it was a kind of a Ferris wheel cosmos where the planets will cross and go up, speed up, and go, seem to go backwards. They do a lot of things that aren't consistent with that. So Copernicus thought if he switched the cosmology from a geocentric to a heliocentric cosmology, he might then be able to get a, a geometry of per perfect circularity out of it. So he was actually not trying to move us forward into an age of progress. He was a restorer of the ancient ideas of the ancients, of this ancient cosmology. But in doing that, though, notice that the cosmology of the world cavern collapsed because now the Earth is circling uh, around the Sun along with all the other planets. There's nothing special about it. Uh, the entire cosmos does not seem any longer to have been created for the benefit of this little nucleus called the Earth in the center of everything. And then before too long, it was discovered that there were other star systems, other uh, nebulae, other galaxies. And it began to be very clear that we are not the center of creation. And so culture uh, lost its womb spherical ceiling, the world dome, and it disappears from Renaissance art right about 1600 by that time. And it takes all the Christian art motifs with it when it collapses. And suddenly, with Dutch art, you're out in full space looking up at the sky, and it's a bright, wide expanse. And now we as a people are out in real space. We're no longer protected by this immunological world dome. So that's gone. And so now uh, it seems to me that the Ovipod has retrieved this idea of the individual inside of a protected womb-like cosmic cavern, only now instead of uh, in Plato's cave where it was the basis of education, you're in a womb cave and you exit the cave to go out to the sun to see where the mathematical forms are that are already imprinted upon your soul and the process of education just consists in reawakening that knowledge. Now you know, with the Ovipod, all of that's gone. Uh, the arts are a shambles, and education is a shambles, and we just have the lone individual isolated in his pod uh, doing this with his thumbs, and it's a sad situation, I yeah. think. Well, it's, it's it's an, time, they've been re replaced by video games. It's games. An, an onanistic thing, and I, so yeah. um, the, the larger... Yeah, uh, sure. Absolutely. Yep. So the... the uh, is this something that Peter Slaughterdyke uh, talks about, the uh, cosmological macrosphere? Mm -hmm. is, this a, is this a concept mm -hmm. you mention sometimes? Yeah. Um, right. 
And and one of the I think maybe one of the images that uh, you talked about uh, was uh, Hieronymus's uh, Hieronymus Bosch, the Garden of Earthly Delights, as described by Wilhelm uh, Frenger. Frenger, I'm not sure how to say it, uh, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and this led in uh, in your book to a discussion of the collapse of the Western macrosphere. Um, and I, I I'm not sure if it's uh, uh, Alain Babieu, who is writing about this um, and the effect that Darwin had uh, on the turmoil of the 20th century, which led to the competing master narratives, uh, because once uh, God has been removed from the equation, um, you have this master narrative of, of competition, uh, either racial competition or class struggle, uh, which ultimately leads to the postmodern condition. Um, and, and you mentioned Cormac uh, McCarthy and the, the kind of nihilism that uh, uh, that we're living in, uh, which maybe is the whole reason for this uh, whole Ove pod and the larger internet in general. So I, I, do those connect the dots in, in a way yeah. that makes sense, or would you, would yes, you they articulate do on right. them? Or? Uh, what you have to consider there with the, with the Garden of Earthly Delights with Hieronymus Bosch, uh, the way that uh, Franger looks at it is that um, it, it's a cosmic drama there. It's, it's three panels, but they close, and on the outside is the, is the world dome. You see it as a gigantic sphere called the right. creation of the world with a flat earth in the shape of a disk surrounded by the dome with God as a little icon, like a Mac icon, hovering up uh, in the left-hand corner. This is his creation, and he's proud of it. And it's closed, and it's a gigantic womb, and it's comforting, and, it, and the human being has a sense when he looks up that he's being taken care of, that everything right. has been thought out for him. Right. And, with, uh, and then as you open the panel, you see the three ages of the spirit, according to Franger, you have the creation of, you have the garden, the creation of... So, uh, so that's significant, though, before you go on, that, that this is closed as a triptych, and this is the, the image yeah. before the triptych is, is open. So the, the right. sequence begins with this sort of comforting image, and right. then unfolds into uh, something all completely different. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that uh, uh, you described is, is, is very interesting, with uh, especially talking about the Adamites, um, uh, which were, uh, I guess, uh, something that Bosch purportedly perhaps was involved with. Um, That's what Kranger believed, that, that yeah. Bosch was an Adamite, which they had some very strange ideas about sexuality, for example, which they regarded as not... Uh, something that is corrupt, but that the practice of sexuality, they were trying to actually go back in their sexual rituals to reconfigure uh, how sexuality took place before the fall. Right. So that little panel that everyone thinks represents, or this is according to Franger, that everyone thinks represents uh, all these amorous couples in delight running around, and because of that, they're headed for the next panel, the hell panel. He says that's a misinterpretation, and actually that, that, those, that gigantic orgy that's going on there in the center panel is the point of the whole painting, right. because uh, right. for the Adamites, this, this sexual liturgy was actually part of their, their practice. A kind of pre prelapsarian uh, uh, innocence. Uh, so that, connecting right. the dots on all of this, you know, it makes me think of Kurzweil's singularity, and uh, maybe what many people think is sort of the result of all of this, that we will be sort of downloaded into some, you know, nanobots will come in and you know, somehow replicate our neural structure, and whether whether or not that happens, you know, who knows? But it's a kind of um, a millenarian fantasy in many problem, ways. Though, the problem, though, with Kurzweil, and I, I haven't read much of him, but from what the gist of what I've seen is that his ideas are symptomatic. They're not. They're not right. good cures for what's going on. He's actually stating in metaphorical language what is already happening. Right. It's that in the future. We're going to be downloaded into cyberspace. We're already in it. You and I, for example, right now have downloaded our consciousness into cyberspace. And so those are uh, metaphors that you find in science fiction novels, like in William Gibson, for example, that are painting this present situation as, as it has already happened. Right. So we're already there. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. And I think that people like Kurzweil are guilty of a misplaced concreteness in the sense that they don't understand metaphorical thinking. And they don't understand the language of science fiction, and they think this this is prophetic of something that's coming and is going to happen. But it's metaphoric language that it captures in a single image, uh, you know, the image of the interface of the, uh, in William Gibson of the the brain with the wires that connect him to the matrix. That's something that's happening right now. That's just a metaf metaphorical way of putting what's going on right now. Because the artist, especially the science fiction artist, is the one who is subliminally aware of what's happening in his society picks up what's happening, doesn't really 
isn't really aware that he is doing that and channels the images out. And the images transform what's going on in the society into a picture language, exactly like the language of dreams that's